Hi, I'm Reverend Drew Terry, and I am the pastor here at Oro Valley United Church of Christ, and it is a joy and a blessing to welcome you this morning to our virtual worship service. Here at Oro Valley United Church of Christ, we say whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are a beloved child of God, and we are so blessed to have you join us this morning. If you'd like to know more about our church, our mission, our life together and happenings at the church, please do check us out at our website or valleyucc.org or you can find us on Facebook as well. We now enter into our time of announcements and like I said, the best way to find out about what's going on in our church is to find us on our website. <clears throat> We are on the cusp of something really big happening in our church. And that really big thing is the birth of my child. My partner is pregnant and any moment now will have a baby. In fact, by the time this worship service, you might be watching this worship service and we're worshiping together, a baby may be here. God, hear our prayer. Um, one of the gifts in a new life is the need to take time to celebrate that gift. And I am deeply grateful, deeply, deeply grateful. Myself, my partner Jade, and my son Nolan, and my new child are deeply grateful because this church, out of the generous Christian spirit, has offered 12 weeks of parental leave. And I am deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your love and support of my family. And it is a gift that I cherish and it is a gift I look forward to sharing with my family and to really being able to focus on my child and the rest of my family for those 12 weeks. During that time, so uh, the church and I have discerned for the time being that the best way to take that 12 weeks is to break it out over, over time. And so the first four weeks are gonna come. So uh, starting worship on May 10th, May 10th through May 31st, we will have some pulpit supply. We'll have other preachers. Primarily we will have Reverend Jay Deskins. He will be leading worship for May 10th, 17th and 24th. He is uh, the head of our summer camp program. He is a Disciples of Christ pastor, which is a sister denomination of the United Church of Christ. He is a wonderful and great guy, and we are just blessed to have his services. We also have Reverend Kari Collins. She is covering pastoral care needs and, and anything else that any sort of spiritual needs the church may have at this time. Uh, both Reverend Dre and Reverend Kari are are open to meeting the church, to getting to know you, especially in this strange time, as best as they are able. We have some contact information for them so you can connect with them directly or just reach out to our office and our office manager, Janet Delgado, will be happy to connect you and get. they wanna get to know you guys so that way they can do the best ministry possible. And I'm just so deeply grateful. I, in this moment, and, and I know it's uncertain, and especially in my own sadness and grief of being away from the church for such a period, I feel the power of God in this moment. I feel the Holy Spirit just being with us and saying, hey, this, this might be a big change. It's a huge change. <laughs> we're gonna get through it. Not only are we gonna get through it, we're gonna thrive through it, we're gonna have new life to celebrate because of it. So I am so grateful. And actually, in a similar spirit of that announcement, I have a, I am very honored and blessed and privileged to share another announcement, i.e. coming, <sighs> Rachel and Kyle Koch, uh, two wonderful, very beloved members of our church. Rachel is pregnant. And I believe, you gotta check with Rachel, I believe she's due in September, which means, yes! <laughs> it means a lot of things, it means awesome, it means great, it means that Coming fall of 2020, Oro Valley UCC is going to need a nursery. <laughs> Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Holy smokes. Nobody saw that coming, huh? Uh, <laughs> isn't God beautiful? So, Rachel, Kyle, we love you so much. We are so grateful to join you in this celebration of life and this blessing. Let us know what you need. Let us know what we can do for you. I'm sure we'll find plenty of things we can do for you, no matter whether we're stay at home or not. So 
Rachel and Kyle, we love you so much and many prayers on this journey. And that's where today's service begins. And, and in the virtual service, we've been practicing a moment of presence and it's always around my socks because I don't wear normal socks. And today's socks are Queen Anne. And I know a lot of you are like, Queen Anne who? Um, my aunt, Aunt Nan, I love you if you are watching this. Uh, and my aunt gave me these socks and what she told me is that if, you're long, if your second toe is longer than your first toe, your big toe, if your second toe is longer than your big toe, uh, you have a special gene and it's called the Queen Anne gene. Who knew? Uh, I, now you know way too much about my toes. But apparently that's something in my family and it's away from my family and we connect in goofy ways. But today is about that. It's about being intimately connected together no matter what's going on. However hard things are, however lonely we are, however scared we are and uncertain we are, whatever the circumstances, we are beloved children of God. We are God's family. We are God's people. And the Holy Spirit is with us. And the Holy Spirit has gotten us this far. And the Holy Spirit's going to keep moving us. And in that spirit, I invite us to take a deep breath. Be in the presence of where you are. Be who you are. Made in God's image. Beloved by the divine. Feel the presence of anyone who is near you. Feel the presence of all those who surround you in love, even though they are physically far away. Feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this time and place as we join together, singing our call to worship. The Lord is our shepherd. We are the sheep of Christ's pasture. The shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures. In Christ, we dwell secure. The shepherd leads us beside still waters and restores our souls. We worship Christ, our shepherd, our gate. Let us pray. Loving shepherd, we feel the wolves close at hand. Gather us to yourself that we might dwell secure in your ways. Deliver us from evil that we might build a community where all may dwell secure. Mark our fellowship with study, prayer, communion, and the sharing of our possessions with those in need. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What are you? 
If you are standing, you may be seated. Please join me in our prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Christ, our shepherd and gate, we would rather chart our own course than be shepherded like sheep. We would rather find our own way than see you as the way. We would rather be shepherds than sheep who are vulnerable and exposed. Forgive us when we bleat our resistance as, your gu as you guide us to higher pastures. Be our gate, our way to safe havens, where we can dwell with you secure. Amen. Dear loved ones, hear these words of God's mercy and assurance of everlasting pardon. The one who anoints our heads with oil, the one who feeds us while our enemies look on, the one who delivers us from evil, invites us to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dear loved ones, today is Communion Sunday. And we are a tradition of Oro Valley United Church of Christ, and on Communion Sunday, we join together in a collective statement from our tradition of Christianity, the United Church of Christ. And we have adopted as a statement of faith, for us it serves as a statement of faith, a portion of the preamble to our denomination's constitution, which I know may, may seem a little strange in a worship setting. For us, these words speak to who we are, who God is calling us to be, and our mission in Christ. Therefore, we feel it is a proclamation of our faith. So please join as you are able in reciting our Preamble to the Constitution. The United Church of Christ acknowledges as its sole head, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and our Savior. It acknowledges as followers of Christ all who share in this confession. It looks to the Word of God and the Scriptures and to the presence of the Holy Spirit to prosper its creative and redemptive work in the world. It claims as its own the faith of the historic church expressed in the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed. It affirms the responsibilities of the church in each generation to make this faith its own in accordance with the teaching of our Lord. It recognizes two sacraments, baptism and holy communion. All members shall have the undisturbed right to follow the word of God as it is made known to them under the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Our scripture today is taken from 1 Peter 2 verses 19 to 25 from the New International Version. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, the one who is truth, we come this day seeking to hear your word of love, the word of assurance and comfort, the reminder that wherever we are, whoever we are, however we identify, whatever chaos surrounds us, especially in this uncertain time of pandemic and stay-at-home orders, that God, your word, the word that gave life, the word that called forth so many before, the word that brought forth peace, 
in the time of uncertainty, in the time of resurrection, will come forth now. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable to you, our God, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Today's scripture passage is a strange one, and it is a challenge. It is an utmost Christian challenge. And there's a lot of levels to this challenge in today's scripture from 1 Peter. The first comes from the historical context of the passage. And not just the historical context, but the words themselves and what they're actually trying to say. You see, 1 Peter writes something that we should take a moment to realize as important and to realize that we need to re-engage this passage in a creative and open way. This passage is actually written to first century Roman slaves. David Bartlett, biblical scholar, points out if we ignore this reality, we ignore the importance of the passage. We gloss over, anytime we gloss over this context, we gloss over the message as well. So what are we do to do with this information? What are we supposed to do with the fact that Peter is telling first century slaves? Slavery, we abhor, and especially for us, we abhor it because it also represents racism and all sorts of rejection of others as God's equal beloved children made in a divine image. So what are we supposed to do? Scott Williamson, a Christian theologian and ethicist builds on Bartlett's thinking that yes, we need to take important the context of this passage and what Peter is at, the audience that the writer is actually directing at and speaking to. And he says we, we, we need to acknowledge this, we need to confess its reality, and we need to once begin to say that no, we don't believe in the audience, we, we don't affirm the insinuation here on the surface. What we can do, though, is hear the writer's message. It's a message that calls us to do two things that are incredibly difficult. To both obey God and to respect the circumstances, the, the treatment imposed upon us by our adversaries and our enemies. Truly what Williamson points out is that what God is calling us to do is be obedient to God's word and to God's way while still loving enemies and treating our adversaries with respect. His, he gave a wonderful example to clarify this confusing call that we hear this morning, this confusing context. And that example is civil rights leader. He pointed out that civil rights leaders maintained obedience to God. They, they wanted to obey the God of Jesus while rejecting the gods of racism and white privilege and white supremacy and segregation and hate. And they did so by filling the jail cells of all those who rejected their path. See, they didn't rise up. They didn't try to fight. They simply stood. And they believed and they followed their inner conscience. And that's what Peter opens with this morning. God's grace is revealed when you unjustly suffer for following your conscience in the path of God. That's the opening to today's passage. So what does that mean? How do you follow that path? Well, M. Eugene Boring, another biblical scholar in this conversation of the difficulty of the context of this passage, of its, of, its, of its message and how we take its message seriously while also recognizing and confessing our own rejection of its cultural implications, points out that what the writer is getting at is a call for mission, not submission. 
A mission to follow God and to rely on God. Again, how do we do this? It's a great question. How? We follow Christ as how. That's the answer. That's the answer that Reverend Randy Mayer, a beloved colleague of mine and one of our pastor of our sister church said, we don't need believers in Christ. We need followers of Christ. That's what this passage is about, being a follower of Christ. Again, what does that mean? How do we do it? I think the answer actually comes from 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, 102 years ago, excuse me, we were in a pandemic. We were caught up in a situation eerily similar to our context now. There was a huge debate about whether or not churches should meet. That if the theory that if churches didn't gather, there would be no Christianity. This fear, the uncertainty, the loss, the grief, the pain, it was all the same. If I had an organist right now telling you this story, I would also cue the Twilight Zone music. Do, 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 do. It's so eerie how similar they were because as the fear and the uncertainty set in, in a time long before computer. In a time when if you were had to stay at home, that was your only reality. There was no hitting up Facebook or trying to get online or a computer. There, was, there wasn't as much ability to go out if you had to stay at home in 1918. So what did churches do? How did churches thrive? How did they live mission? They did it in an eerily similar way we are doing it. They did it printing out bulletins. Bulletin after bulletin after bulletin. They printed out Sunday school lessons, Sunday school lessons, Sunday school lessons, Sunday school lessons. They printed out with a long, long, they created these little packets. So they had Sunday school, they had worship, and they also had instructions on how to do in-home worship. And at this time, if you need to, please do pause, or you can pause after the sermon, and set your t communion table up, because as you can tell, we're gonna have communion later in the service. And we would love for you to join us and break bread and drink cup with us. Just like in 1918, when they were giving them instructions on how to do worship, giving them packets to do in-home worship. And the conversation about churches meeting or not meeting, a Methodist evangelist in Alabama spoke these words, that the pandemic was an opportunity to convince intelligent Christians to trust science rather than tempting God to perform a miracle in the preservation of health. They chose mission. They chose following Christ. They chose, see, what those words, that giving up to trust somebody else, that saying we need to prioritize staying healthy over Christian theory and practice, was the willingness to follow Christ, who never gave up the mission because of circumstances, who, as Peter points out, never returned insult with insult, who, Peter, who the writer of this letter points out, never, even when violence was being placed upon Jesus in unthinkable ways, never jeopardized the call within the conscience, to follow the path. As Peter says, trusting in God who judges justly. It's a hard message. It's a tough one. It's confusing because no one should suffer violence. And if you are suffering violence, I pray that you find help. I pray that you reach out to us and we'd love to do what we are able to help you find relief. 
God's promise of liberation. But just as we are not Jesus, I pray, who may be suffering incredible violence, just as we weren't that Jesus, and just as we are not, thank God, slaves, we still struggle. The question that this passage raises for us is do we struggle in peace and do we struggle to follow our conscience? See, our forebears in 1918, facing a daunting task, without Facebook, without Zoom, without any of this, they followed their conscience, and they followed God's call, and they followed with a leap of faith to give and to give abundantly, to the point where I have actually never heard of a church story about the pandemic prior to this event. There was so much Christian faith, so much Christian persistence into the struggle. So what do we do now? This question was brought up a couple weeks ago in our Bible study. We asked, what makes a Christian a Christian? How do we live out Christianity? And the Bible said, it, it made my heart leap with joy. They said, give. We give. We give. <laughs> Generosity. David Bartlett, the same guy who said we have to take the historical context and the audience of the passage seriously, also says that one of the most repeated themes of Scripture is the spirit of generosity. The idea of living graciously. Because Bartlett says if you live graciously... You learn to live prayerfully. If you give of yourself over and over and over and over again, even in times of crisis, if in a time of crisis, when there are no computers, you say, pick up that new invention from Alexander Graham Bell and call a friend. If you're instructing people how to do their own worship services, if you are giving up your authority to speak truth because you know that God's truth is coming from scientists, you are living graciously and you are living prayerfully. So how do we do that? First of all, I, I, I can actually only begin this sermon in the past and in the current moment. Because this church, this community, is filled with abundance of giving. One, this church has answered the call over the past six weeks to support our community, to support our mission, so that way we can serve others, so that way we can continue to care for those who are isolated, to care for those who are sick, to offer up support and love to people who have no one else to pray for those who are in service, to support and care for those who are serving. We have a bag of masks, medical, homemade medical masks sitting out here, and it's been going left and right. Please tell your friends, tell everyone, Or Valley United Church of Christ has free masks, thanks to Ann Walker. That's what this community does. This community, when new life is created, says we have to do ministry temporarily different so that our pastor can have the spiritual gift to be at home nurturing the spiritual, physical, emotional, psychological well-being of the family and of himself to be even better in community. It's about giving not just of our finances, which are wonderful gifts. It's about driving the ICS. It's about when we're making the two-week grocery list, buying extra gifts so we can take them to ICS. It's about the time you are giving my family and myself. It's about all the love and care. It's about the amount of time you spent writing letters to one another, calling one another, emailing one another. It's about giving up not only your time and your, 
and your resources and your talents. It's about giving of yourself. It's about not letting stay at home define you. Simply redefine how you express your Christian love and your Christian commitment to trust the one who is just, to trust the God who comes, who came in 1918 and got churches through, who came in 1865 to free our nation, especially our African-American siblings, from the burdens of slavery. It's trusting in the God who broke open those jail cells that Scott Williamson points out we're filled with civil rights leaders standing for God's justice. It's about trusting the God who liberated them. It's about trusting the God who we believe in today, who we follow today to do the right thing. It's about giving to the point when you ask that question, can we still give? Because we're at that point, right? We're at that point in this whole journey where we're beginning to wonder how much longer can we do it? And we were reminded by Peter's opening words, God's grace is given when you struggle for the conscience that follows God, the conscience in the name of God. When we follow our hearts, when we stay connected to one another in prayer and love, when we give everything we can, we are able. We will find the fulfillment of 1 Peter's words today. Once you were lost, wandering sheep, now you have been returned to the guardian of your soul. Amen. Dear loved ones, we now enter into our, our time of offering. And in this time, we take a moment to celebrate all of the gifts we are able to share. First of all, I want to give a big thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of our community. Thanks for commenting on Facebook. Keep sending your love through Facebook. Oh, it's so much fun to read the comments. Uh, and if you're not able to comment on Facebook or anything, shoot us an email. Send us a note. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll, we'd love to be in touch with you. I, I can't give a big enough thank you. One of the greatest gifts I have ever received is from this church, and it's an abundance of time to be with my family in a critical time. 
And I am deeply grateful for that gift. And I know it is a gift from God. And I know that living into this, it's a challenging gift. It's a challenging gift for me as I, as I take a break from the church, as I step away to be with family and focus on family. I, I've heard from many of you that it, it's going to be a, a time of, of just being different. And, and even a, maybe a time of sadness on some of all. I, I am just grateful, though, because I know that we're following our conscience in, in the name of God. We're following our faith. And we're all doing the right thing. And therefore, I have great faith, as First Peter points out, that God's grace will abundantly shine on us, just as it's abundantly shined on us for 2,000 years and for this church for over 25 years. I also want to give a big thank you in this time of offering to the offerings of Reverend Jay Deskins and Reverend Cardi Collins and their service and ministry. I also want to give a big thank you in this time of offering to all our leaders, to our church council members, to Lana Wilson, to Uriah Harrell, to Jennifer Conrad, to Bruce Fisher, Carol Sack, Carolyn Watson, Grace Berg, uh, to our finance leaders, Rachel Koch, and S Stu Kraft, and Craig McGorry. They have worked so hard, and also no amount of thanks could ever match. But thank you, thank you, thank you to our office man manager, Janet Delgado, to Jose Solerzano, Matt Rinaldi, and Kyle Cope for all the love and the passion they've put in, especially in this time. We are doing this as a community. We're following our conscience. And thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you for all the gifts and all the love you have poured out into this community and being a part of this community, just being with us today. We love you so much, and we're so grateful to have you. And in this time of offering, we take a moment to to lift up what gifts, take a moment to reflect on the abundance that God has poured out onto us, even in a time like this, and celebrate those wonderful moments in which we have shared that love with others, whether it's giving of our, our money, giving of our time, giving of our talent, whether it's sharing lifetime with a, one person, or it's sharing a smile and a wave to a stranger. In this time of offering, however you have shared God's abundant love with the world, I invite you to place your hand on your heart and lift up in prayer all the ways that you have shared God's love with creation. Please join me in our invitation to the offering. Our abundant life is described in Acts as a result of fellowship, breaking our bread together, prayer, attention to the apostles' teachings, and sharing all things in common. The early disciples were a people of prayer who shared their joys and concerns and their passions and sorrows with one another and with the Lord. For burdens shared are burdens lessened, and joys shared are joys enriched, and gifts shared are gifts multiplied. For the blessings that come in our lives, let us offer our thanks through these gifts, gifts to our church, our community, and the world. Amen. And before Jose plays our offertory music, I do want to invite you into multiple ways you can contribute to our church at this time. If you are able, um, we have, you can give through our website, orvalleyucc.org. You can also uh, mail a check to 1401 East El Conquistador Way, Oro Valley, Arizona. 85704. Our office manager, Janet Delgado, is checking the mail on a regular basis. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to know other options for giving, such as bank bill pay and so forth, please do feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to help you. And now invite us into our time of offertory music.
teach us with the awe that came upon those early disciples as they beheld the signs and wonders performed in their midst by the apostles. May the gifts we offer this day be a remembrance of their commitment to share all things in common. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter into our time of prayer together. And in this time, we take a moment to lift up the prayers of our world and our community. Uh, we open with a prayer for healing. Uh, we pray for Marja, Ann Walker's daughter, who is sick and um, all this, all the showing symptoms of COVID-19. As of right now, we're still waiting for a test. I, I imagine we'll wait for an update from Ann, but let's hold Marja and the whole Walker family in our prayers at this time, prayers that Hopefully, you know, it's not COVID-19, whatever it is that she quickly heals and quickly is able to return to the life God has blessed her with. We also in this time pray for Denny Ginsman, Peggy McGorry's dad. Um, he, he is in the hospital. He has low sodium and is not doing, he, he's not feeling well. Um, and so they're, they're helping him. We are grateful he's safe and in a place where they can take good care of him. Prayers for him, prayers for Peggy and Craig in this time. And hopefully Denny heals quickly and also is able to return to life that God has blessed him with. Also, prayers for healing for Craig McGorry's nephew, Tom McGorry. Um, he, he lost, he had some sight issues, lost sight in one eye, had, had sight issues with the other eye, and they did a bunch of tests and they found out that he has a hole on his heart. And so we're lifting up Tom today and praying that he heals quickly, that there, he was, he's going through surgery actually, um, and, and pray that surgery went well. Pray that the doctors and nurses are filled with wisdom and compassion. And prayers for Craig and Peggy and the whole McGorry family at this time. And prayers especially for Tom's wife and child. We also pray for <clears throat> our world as, as we continue through this pandemic. We give prayers of thanksgiving for the slow... Um, the slow opening, the, the reality that, you know, places like Wuhan and Italy have started to slowly come back. We pray that that wisdom leads. We pray that it is a healthy and a safe reopening. We, we continue to pray, though, that all is well. And we pray that swiftly God's Holy Spirit will bring us back to life. And in the meantime, we pray that we continue to follow the Holy Spirit, that we continue to trust in God, who is the one who gives life and love, and that we follow that path with the faith that God will lead us to all that we need. I, will, I, I can't stop saying it because I'm just filled with so much love. I, I give a prayer of thanksgiving for this church and its generosity, especially on this day the as I, as I enter into parental leave, I am so deeply, deeply grateful for this church and, and it fills me with joy to be a part of this community and to be in this community. Thank you, thank you so much. And prayers for both of us, prayers for myself and my family and Jade and our baby and Nolan as we all grow together in this new life and new reality, especially in this time of pandemic. Prayers for this church as it goes through a strange and unusual time in a strange and unusual time. And prayers that the words of God are fulfilled. That as long as you follow the right path, God will be there and God's grace will be revealed. Uh, prayers of thanksgiving and prayers for the leadership of Reverend Jay Deskins and Reverend Kari Collins. Thank you to both of them for their willingness to lead and prayers for their ministry in our church and in our community. Let us go to God in a moment of prayer. 
Dear God, the one who is love, peace, and healing, we come to you in a strange and unusual time. We come knowing our own concerns. We come aware of our own vulnerabilities and humanity, of our own struggles and challenges, of the loneliness, of the fear, of the uncertainty. We also come knowing the concerns of our loved ones near and far, known and unknown, of all those who are sick, of all those who have died during this time, of all those care workers, essential workers, grocery store workers, truck drivers, all those who have answered the call to enter into the world and to be on the front line so that we may continue to share in your abundance in a healthy and safe way. God, we come to you as your children, beloved, cared for, and held intimately in your Holy Spirit's arms. Seeking once again that this day and all days to come, you will remind us as you did eons before and every day before this one, that you are with us. That when we cry, you cry with us. That you hold us and you lead us to continue to follow in your path, doing your will and living fully and eternally in the light of your love. These prayers and the prayers in our hearts, we lift up singing the words of Christ. As we enter into our time of Holy Communion, I invite you to stand as you are able in body or spirit and join in our hymn, There's a Quiet Understanding.
Please, if you have not had a chance to, please do. You can pause us and uh, we won't go anywhere. Go ahead and set your table. You can use any elements you want to. Bread, crackers, English muffin, donuts, whatever you've got um, for drink, milk, wine, water, whatever will bring you the fulfillment of Christ in this time. For Holy Communion this morning, we sanctify our time and many tables. For a sacrament never confined to sanctuaries or precious surfaces carved with do this in remembrance of me. But always following wherever one of God's precious children, like a sheep astray, is lost or needs a guide. Christ is our shepherd in the loneliest lockdown. We do not want for companionship. In crowded families, distance learning and never catching our breath, we find an inner source of still waters. In the soul-stretching days of healthcare and emergency professionals, decision makers for others, and essential workers with daily risks, we meet a restorer of souls. In the paths of tightiousness, assisted living, correctional facilities, shelter, immigration detention, nursing home, housing for those who are simply poor, we find a leader, a staff to lean on, a rod that points a new way. Christ leads us not around it, but through the valley of the shadow and turns to us as Jesus did when he came through the walls of a locked room in the afternoon of resurrection, saying, peace be with you. And then asks if they had anything to give him to eat. Give the gentle shepherd who is the risen Christ your bread, your cup, and your heart. We have bread and cup and heart. Our church community is dispersed in distance, but we are one in Christ in your many kitchens and living rooms. Rest your hands now lightly upon these elements, which we set aside today to be a sacrament. Let us ask God's blessing together upon them and upon us and upon those who are in our prayers this morning. Gentle host, you prepare a table before us in the threatening presence of virus. You anoint our hearts, bless our bread, and our cups overflow. Surely as we shelter in place, we find both the goodness of community and mercy to those most vulnerable. Now, in all the days of our lives, we claim that this house, these many houses where we dwell, and also our precious church building are indeed the house of God. Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon your children who are staying at home so that this bread may be broken and gathered in love and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live in us that we may live in you. Breathe in us that we may breathe in you. Amen. We remember the sharing of bread in many places, wilderness manna, tents and caves of shepherds, Abigail's saddlebags, the lunch of a small boy, the fish of the disciples, and the loaf of a man. And we remember that Paul the Apostle wrote letters to congregations throughout places we now call Greece, Turkey, and Macedonia. And they were the first remote worship resources, including these communion words sent to the church at Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again in eternal fulfillment and glory. Let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. We are one in Christ and the bread we share. Let us eat and be made whole. Let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing. We are one Christ, one in Christ in the cup we share. Let us drink and know God's eternal peace. Let us pray in thanksgiving for this meal of grace. Rejoicing that in the holy dispersion of virtual worship, we claim the risen Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands, nor contained in human ceremonies, and celebrating the God shepherding that carries us into the unknown to listen and follow, to lead and be led, to feed and be fed. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need your tender care, and your pleasant pastures feed us. For our use, your folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear your children when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear your children when we pray. Jesus for the shepherd, good shepherd, here we are, the family. Listen and follow. O oh, love, lead your children to you. O oh, love, feed your children. Amen. Dear loved ones, it's not goodbye. It's the words of our closing song from every day. God be with you until we meet again. I will miss you dearly. I will hold you in my heart. And you are intimately with me and I pray that you feel my presence with you. Because where I will be, I will be giving your love, the love of Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit to new life. To new life brought by God. And I am so grateful for that. And I'm so excited to come back to you when, I, when, God, when God will lead us back together very soon, in a month. <laughs> so I will miss you. And remember, wherever we go, whoever we are, whoever God calls us to be, the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. In pastures green, we rest secure. Our shepherd leads us forth by still waters. We rest secure. Our shepherd brings us abundant life. Go with the blessings of our shepherd. Hearing the words of the good news. Return to the guard. You have returned to the guardian of your souls. Amen. Oh.